Good morning, and welcome to Pick Classic Theatre's annual celebration of Bloomsday. That day in 1904, when, in the imagination of James Joyce, one Leopold Bloom set out on an odyssey throughout the streets of Dublin. We begin with the very first chapter of the book, Telemachus. Now, this episode introduces the young and rather embittered Stephen Dedalus in the company of one Buck Mulligan. Homer's The Odyssey begins on the Greek island of Ithaca, the home of Odysseus, otherwise known as Ulysses, and he's been missing since the Trojan War ended many years previously. In his absence, suitors for the hand of Penelope, his wife, have taken over the royal palace, and the boldest of these suitors is called Antinous. Odysseus's son Telemachus watches helplessly as his father's goods are laid waste by these usurpers. In the episode of the book Ulysses, medical student Malachy, known as Buck Mulligan, performs a parody of the mass on top of the Martello Tower in Sandymount, in the company of the teacher and aspiring writer, one Stephen Dedalus. Stephen is in fact Homer's Telemachus. Mulligan is Homer's Antinous. Here, reading from Telemachus, is Ken Bolden. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather, on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altre die. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding land, and the awakening mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to the barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and wounds. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomus. Two strong shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That'll do nicely. Oh, switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathered about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up followed him wearily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd too. Malachy Mulligan, hm. two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. Oh, we must go to Athens. Will you come, if I can get the ant to fork out twenty quid? He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come? <laughs> the jejun Jesuit! <laughs> Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Hayes going to stay in this tower? 
Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful, he said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. <laughs> God, these bloody English, bloody, bursting with money and indigestion because he comes from Oxford. <laughs> you know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. <laughs> he can't make you out. Ah, oh, my name is the best for you. Kinch, the knife blade. <laughs> he shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on, I'm off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket said, lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then gazing over the handkerchief said, the bard's nose rag. A new art color for our Irish poets. Snot green. <laughs> you can almost taste it, can't you? <laughs> he mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it? Great sweet mother. The snot green sea the scrotum tightening sea. <laughs> Epionipa pontum. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks. I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata, our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingston. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly his gray searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you. Buck Mulligan said, I'm Hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care and silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm over his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain, that was not yet the pain of love, fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death. Her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, a breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuffage, he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. 
The bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, oh, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. Are oh, the second hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy brows he left them off. Oh, I have a lovely pair with a hair stripe, grey. You look spiffing in them. Oh, I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they are grey. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly and with stroking palps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea into the plump face with his smoke blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have GPI. He's up at Duttyville with Cuddly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong well-knit trunk. And look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack. Hair on end, as he and others see me. Who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? Asks me too. I pinched it out of the skivvies room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps plain looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not into temptation. <laughs> and her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban had not seen his face in a mirror, he said. If Wilde were only alive to see you. Ooh. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stevens and walked with him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like this, is it, Kinch? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Parried again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his cold steel pen. Cracked looking glass of a servant. Hmm. Tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's stinking with money and thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fella made his tinsel and jalap to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch. If you and I could only work together, we might do something for the island. Helen eyes it. Cranley's arm. His arm. And to think of your having to beg from these swine. I'm the only one that knows what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Haynes? If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour and we'll give him a ragging worse than they gave Clive Kempthorpe. Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kempthorpe's rooms. Pale faces, they hold their ribs with laughter, one clasp in another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news to her gently, Aubrey. I shall die. With slit ribbons of his shirt whip in the air, he hops and hobbles round the table, with trousers down at heels, chased by aides of Magdalene with a tailor's shears. A scared calf's face gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me. Shouts 
from the open window, startling evening in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, aproned, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of Grashams. To ourselves, new paganism, on follows. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him, except at night. Then what is it? Buck Mulligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Brayhead that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? He asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. Light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered. Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush, which made him seem younger and more engaging, rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? He asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? He asked. Your mother's or yours or my own? You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the Mater in Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asks you. Why? Because you have the curse of Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor, Sir Peter Teasel, and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd. I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offense to me? Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person! he exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Chuck Loyola Kinch, and come on down. The Sassenach wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day, he said. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, 
but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery. For Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. In shore and farther out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light shod hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea. The twinning stresses, two by two, a hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twinning chords, wave white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him, a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music. Silent with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards powdered with musk, a god of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny window of her house when she was a girl. She heard old Royce sing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible and laughed with the others when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset his brooding brain. Her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament. A cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for her at the hob on a dark autumn evening. Her shapely fingernails, reddened by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently she had come to him. Her wasted body with its loose grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul on me alone. The ghost candle to light her agony, ghostly light on the tortured face. Her house, hoarse, loud voice rattling in horror while all prayed on their knees, her eyes on me to strike me down. Liliata, autolantium, ate cafesorum, turma circumdet, iubilantium, te virginum, chorus excipiet, ghoul, chewer of corpses. No, mother, let me be and let me live. Kinch! Ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from within the tower. He came near up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard the warm running sunlight, and in the air behind him friendly words. Daedalus, come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. It's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do, for Jesus' sake, Buck Mulligan said. For my sake and for all our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him, your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? Oh, a guinea, I mean. 
I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip, Buck Mulligan cried with delight. Uh, how much? Four quid? Lend us one? If you want it, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight. We'll have a glorious drunk to astonish the droody druids. Four omnipotent sovereigns. He flung up his hands and tramped down the stone stairs, singing out of tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer and wine, on coronation, coronation day. Oh, won't we have a merry time, on coronation day. Thank you.